Yeah. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much for joining me today. We're uh, at uh, our Zoom Q&A for lesson number eight. So today we're going to look at a few things, but uh, the, the main event uh, coming out of today is the plant system design. And um, that's always been dear to my heart. And uh, I hopefully we'll be putting everybody on the right path here. Um, this lesson, it may seem kind of funny, we're doing a, a small plant system design, but the reality is we're getting you kind of warmed up for doing a, a, a larger planting scheme. So <clears throat> with this lesson, what we're hoping to do is just take a very small area and have you consider uh, the existing plants that might be there and how you can improve that through some of your plant choices. And um, yeah, that's sort of it in a nutshell. But let's take a look at the lesson itself here. All right. Yeah, so lesson eight. So there's two parts. Uh, the local plant survey, as you can see here, is a small um, small part of that, uh, important nonetheless. And very interesting to see, you know, five native or naturalized plants that are medicinal, that are in your area and what they're used for. And this... Um, I must say, even though it's only worth four points, this has really uh, proved to be a very interesting component in our lives over the last uh, decade or so. And it's just amazing what, um, how much medicine is actually around you at any one time. Even some of the ornamental plants I used to use in my earlier work, um, quite shocked to find that they had medicinal properties. So. It's, um, yeah, very interesting first part here. Um, but it is pretty, pretty straightforward. We want uh, them to be local and we want botanical or scientific names uh, as well as any common names with that. So I think that is pretty, pretty straightforward. Uh, do either one of you have any questions about that? I think if not, I will um, jump into the plant system design because that to me is going to be where people potentially, uh, well, you can potentially have quite a bit more fun there, um, but there is going to be uh, definitely more work involved with that. So let's take a look at what we're after here. So, so it, it's again, this is going to be sort of a step stone, a small uh, plant design within your project site. And, you know, it can be any size you want, but it doesn't have to be particularly large. Um, but there's a few things that we want to, to, to ask you. So with this, We'll call it guild or uh, plant system design. We want to consider what um, what you're hoping to achieve. You know, is it for habitat creation, production, aesthetics? It could be for all of the above. Um, I like to certainly blend aesthetics into other uh, other items such as habitat creation or production. Um, what zone is it in, the level of management. So you want to try and choose at least two individual plants that are of similar structure. So I think where we're going with this is we really want to, um, if you can, get two tree or large shrub elements, uh, depending on your project size and what you're, what you're working with. Um, and then once you get a couple of large plants, it's time to start to uh, uh, utilize those in order to put together some of the other layers that you have in mind. And hopefully that is going to be uh, shrub and herbaceous and uh, possibly climbers and ground covers. So 
try and cover off all of the uh, all of the layers that you can, given the space that you're working with. Um, and then you've got to do a little bit of research on the plants. And honestly, this you might find will be a lifelong uh, journey for you. Uh, I know for myself, when I started uh, out in uh, horticulture, and what really drew me in were working with plants and um, probably spent a decade just really focused on learning my plant material. And, you know, I mean, even today, uh, maybe not today in particular, but in recent uh, recent days, you come across new items and uh, there's always something new to learn. Uh, but you do develop, I would say, a palette, a planting palette that uh, um, really works for the area that you're working in. Um, and, you know, you get to really know these plants well. So for us, we're, we really want to use... Um, we want to, when I say us, I mean my wife and myself, um, when we're designing, we want to, you know, include a wide variety of material, but we also really want to make sure that, um, uh, they're durable. Uh, they have a lot to offer. Maybe it just aesthetic, but maybe there's some medicinal, um, components to that, uh, and habitat for sure. Um, yeah, so it, it's not, um, I'd say in a lot of ways, this is really a tough part of design when you're starting because, you know, a lot of what you do is going to be based on your plant knowledge. And, um, you know, the <clears throat> honestly, the only way to improve that is to um, again, play with, <laughs> play with these designs, you know, design something, install it, and then observe it and see how that goes. And that is essentially what we've done over the years. And, uh, so you end up narrowing, uh, your scope a little bit in that, um, some of the plants that you prefer to work with, uh, in certain situations. So don't feel like, uh, um, well, what I might suggest is if you, if you're still feeling a little bit, um, what's the right word, not awkward, but not completely comfortable with this, you know, it may take some time to work through. Um, I would say that some of these other layers like working with water, uh, that sort of thing may be quite a bit easier. Uh, in that it's not, you know, we're dealing with living plant materials. So it's one thing to design it, and then it's another to ensure that it does really well. So uh, let's see some of the things that uh, we've got in our notes here. So yeah, you want to do a little bit of research, uh, some of the important considerations. <clears throat> so some of the ecological services, some of these primary species provide. And, um, you know, that could be as simple as being a pollinator. Um, and especially at this time of year, I don't know about your areas of the world, but up on the east coast of Vancouver Island here, we're on uh, sort of a level five drought now. So we have had... We haven't had much rain for quite a while, and it's actually clouded up and drizzling today. I don't think it'll amount to a lot, but um, yeah, it's uh, it uh, is very very dry, and uh, I'm just trying to remember where I was going with this. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, no, I'll get back to it. I'm, I'm sure. Um, oh, there I go. <clears throat> so when I'm talking about, say, drought, where what we're experiencing uh, and uh, pollination, uh, that is a huge, a huge piece. And I've certainly noticed this year that um, 
those pollinator plants that are really key to holding some of these native bee populations, um, you know, they're, they're struggling a little bit. And uh, so that's something you might want to keep in the back of your back of your mind when you're putting together any sort of planting regime is, you know, at this time, July and August, when it gets a little bit lean, uh, what, you know, in particular, some herbaceous plants, what can they offer uh, to some of the insects to support them? And I can tell you yesterday, I was noticing some of our oregano and, oh my God, they're just covered in bumblebees. So something to keep in mind. And um, there are a lot of things to keep in mind. So it, this is why it does take a little bit of practice uh, to go through this and you know, I guess it's a lot like I, I don't paint. Uh, I have some family members that do, but I would imagine it has a similar experience in that we're, uh, we're continually observing what we do and trying to improve on it. So again, some of the things to consider here, uh, ecological function, uh, the yield, and that can be, you know, that could be food or fiber or uh, you know, it could be a whole range of yields, uh, could be an aesthetic yield, could be that it is a nitrogen fixing plant. So the yield is uh, for other plants in the area. Um, Why do you place each plant in its chosen position? And, you know, if I was asked that about every single plant that I had on a drawing, that might be kind of hard to answer. So don't get too bent out of shape about it. Uh, I'm going to show you some examples today. And, um, you know, a lot of placement that we do, once you get to know your plant material, is, is really giving things the space that they need. And, um, uh, you know, I've seen, and I'm sure you have too, uh, people will often overplant an area. Um, and that's not so bad with herbaceous plants, but you, all the woodies you want to, you know, your tree and shrub layers, you want to give them space through their entire lifetime. Uh, that way you don't have to come in and do some, uh, make some hard choices later. So that's a biggie. And I'll certainly show you uh, how we apply that in some of our examples. So you want adequate space to manage, um, of course. And then it gets into, you know, this could be a course all onto its own, really, because we're looking at, um, you know, do we clump individuals? Uh, do we have you know, individual plants that are like features, do you, you know, do drifts of them? There's, there's many, many different um, approaches. So we're going to touch on those a little bit. Um, you know, curve, curve literature rows. Yeah, you don't really want to do the formal straight bit, although, you know, we, we can go there when with the hard surface, but when we get into the planting, uh, I would suggest you stay away from that. Uh, and layering plants by height, this is a huge part, uh, in my opinion, uh, and a solar bowl. So maybe you have a little microclimate that you want to optimize. And um, how do they support each other? Well, you that could be a uh, very difficult to answer um, there might be some obvious things, but I would say generally trees, shrubs, and herbaceous plants in these different layers, um, naturally support one another. Uh, but we'll again, touch on that. And we want to just make sure that you're using what, what's called scientific names or botanical names. Uh, in addition to the common names. Now, the reason for that is when we're identifying plants on a drawing, we want to be really sure that it's um, uh, clear what our intention is. So botanical names, scientific names are the way we're going to uh, ensure that 
not only your client, but uh, a nursery or an installer knows exactly what your intention is. And then there's some elements here. We want to see your existing conditions. So that's your base plan. Uh, and with that, we're going to have a statement of purpose and goals. So that's a really good exercise to go through. And then on your base map, just indicate uh, where that area of interest or area of focus is. And then your proposed plan, what, what you're hoping to do there um, with some details uh, and some notes perhaps, uh, as well as a plant legend. So that's pretty straightforward. Uh, the next little bit is a uh, tricky ish. So doing a cross section, um, you know, normally we don't do that for clients and that's something I can show you a little bit more if we have time, some of our deliverables, but this is a good exercise to go through with the course. Now, you know, why is that? Well, it gives you that, um, on the ground, uh, look or feel of, uh, what your intention is. And perhaps when you do that, you can go, wow, didn't realize I, I've missed a certain layer that um, I should uh, include. Maybe it needs a bit more shrub material. You know, it can be a, well, it's something that I think eventually you just have in the back of your mind, uh, the proportion of tree, shrub, and herbaceous, and uh, how that all interacts with, uh, with the theme that you're hoping to do and the space you have to work with. Uh, as well, do a little bit of a plant species matrix. So that's more of a spreadsheet and some of the interrelationship. So it's a pretty deep uh, assignment. Uh, there's no doubt of that. Um, the key things that I'm, you know, looking for are, of course, in the rubric here. So as long as you're covering off your, your items that are listed here, you're going to get... Uh, marked accordingly. And uh, again, don't spend, uh, you know, a disproportionate amount of time on the plant survey. Uh, most of my feedback will be involving the plant system design itself. So let's take uh, a look. If we look at the template file here, you can see we've got a couple of examples. Um, let's see if I can make this a little bit bigger. Okay. Yeah, that's not the best example in the world. Let me see if I can just find it. I tell you what we'll do. Uh, we will go back. Uh, actually, I think I have to sign in. So if you, I don't know how many people take a look at this when they sign in. Um, but if you go to that module section, and there are some sample reports here. Let's take a look at this one. I'll just skip ahead. Not going to worry about the plant survey, but <clears throat> all right. So we look at this person's plant system design. You can see they've got a statement of purpose. They've got their goals. They have um, a base plan uh, shown at the bottom here. And they've indicated on their on that what the area of interest is, and then above here is what uh, is reflected there. So this is the space that they are choosing to work with. Now, I would say that's a pretty large area. 
So you don't necessarily have to do that with uh, this assignment. Eventually, you know, with your final design, you'll definitely want to cover um, areas that you'd hope to, um, and not necessarily all areas of your uh, project site, that's for certain, especially um, Ashley's got a very large project site, and I, I can't imagine you designing every square foot of it, but there's certainly going to be areas where that uh, you really want to dial into. So again, you don't have to uh, take on this much for this exercise if you don't want to. It could be quite small. And here is what the student is proposing. Uh, so they are doing a smallish area, so that's good. <clears throat> so I would say that, you know, ah, okay, <clears throat> excuse me. I misread this a little bit. <clears throat> This area here uh, is probably a little bit large based on what you're seeing here. Um, but this is the area they're after. So that's great. That is a good size. And uh, this is what they've done. So they have a uh, fig in there and some gooseberries. And then they've showed some, some other lower herbaceous items. Uh, they've also got an interesting note here because they're on a bit of a berm, how they're going to deal with that. And um, yeah, that's one of those things when you're designing, you got to factor in uh, whether there is slope and how you might uh, deal with that. So, and you can see with this student, um, this cross section, which is a nice one, uh, they have a background and then they're showing what they're doing with the grade here. <clears throat> and that's certainly something that uh, one could consider. Um, the other thing that you could also consider, and I'm not saying any of these are, are necessarily right or wrong, but uh, you know, you could retain this end here, right? That's one way of dealing with slope is retaining and that can be done in any number of ways through, you know, blasted rock through um, uh, walls itself. Um, this isn't very high. So <clears throat> the only thing I would caution people, and I noticed this the other day in our landscape, when we get into these really dry seasons and we're looking at slopes like this, just be mindful that whatever you plant here, is really got to be a zero escape uh, item. Um, when you're watering uh, on a flat surface, you tend to get way more infiltration than you would on a slope. So what you'll probably find is the water wants to just move off of that. And uh, so you don't get nearly as much infiltration. Um, so just something to keep in mind with slopes. <laughs> But this is a nice section, uh, section drawing here, and it's quite clear. And this person has a tree and a shrub layer. <clears throat> and then they've got a whole bunch of herbaceous. And and the this actually might be quite hard with a fig because they are uh, so fibrous, the root system. I It might be tough to happily have anything growing that close to it. But um, if it's a small plant, you know, that, that would certainly be more doable. Uh, there's a little note here on watering, which is great. So they're going to do micro, micro tube drip irrigation. Uh, certainly a, a good thing to do, drip irrigation. And um, yeah, the other thing that strikes me is you have a, a driveway here. And it may, this may have been a, a you know, an opportunity that the student saw later, uh, but we're going to have uh, certainly quite a bit of water um, coming off of that driveway during the winter months. And, you know, so that may have been something that this person factored in passively sending water into their landscape. You never know. Uh, it is certainly something that, um, we see uh, this year with uh, the drought, 
that uh, even with a huge rain garden we put in um just quite amazing what's going on with uh with water this year so yeah that that's a nice job here so then we go on to the plant uh species matrix which is really just listing all the plants that are in the drawing and then you know giving a little bit of um depth to what they're all about now when i'll show you what we do with our plant lists it's very different than this this is you know, this is very useful exercise to go through. I don't know if I would necessarily do this for a client, uh, depending on how much time you've allocated uh, for your design. And then your SWOT analysis here, so which is kind of standard to what um, we're used to seeing. Um, so that is one example. Does anybody have any questions that they'd like to to ask about that or put in the chat. Okay. No problem. Um, yeah, if you do have a question, you don't hesitate to unmute yourself or you can just place something in the chat and I'll keep my eyes on that. Uh, maybe what we'll do is I will stop sharing that. And I will just share a drawing that uh, we have here as an example. Now, <clears throat> bear in mind, um, this is this is kind of a deliverable that we provide for our clients. So it's you know it's going to have uh, some relevance to the assignment. Uh, and some not, there won't be relevance in some ways. So we don't, again, we don't do a cross-section drawing. Um, don't need to. I mean, I don't need to. I can sort of visualize what, what's going on with this. So uh, maybe what I'll do before I dive into this is just um, give you a quick shot of what we did here. This is Part of a base plan that we did we had a drone survey done on this property so we ended up with um uh it makes it mapping so much easier and as well as we've got contour data which was uh, vital then we went ahead and did this water layer <clears throat> so when we do uh when we do an acreage uh, design we start with the concept so we're doing much like you're doing with the course here. It's a uh, it's a rough. Well, I won't call it rough. It's it's an initial concept that we refine based on our our clients' feedback. And um, once we get to the end of the design phase, which uh, I'll show you, uh, then we look at details and the details are actually part of the planting plan that we'll review today. So that was an extra, um, kind of the second part of the design. So let me go back. Uh, this is water. So we do a water layer where we're calculating average annual rainfall and roof surfaces. And, and here we have usage and collection data. So we're trying to figure out, you know, what roofs to collect off of based on their approximate usage. And um, they're in a very dry area. Uh, so they are subject to water restrictions. And right now they would, they would have that. So rainwater harvesting was a big part of their uh, project. And in this version, which I think was changed. Uh, they're collecting off a couple of roof surfaces on a workshop that is right here. So it's away from the house and it's going into uh, two pump chambers and pump chambers are then pushing it into storage. That's not too far away. So I think here we had um, 
12,000 gallons of storage. Looks like we have 15. Yeah, well, it depends on what. Uh, yeah, there's 15 here. Um, and then these charts below kind of show us what to expect uh, with that much storage based on what we know uh, in terms of average annual rainfall and approximate usage. So this, you know, we won't get into that. This is uh, a deep subject to get into, but um, this was a played a big part in uh, this project. How are we going to irrigate the landscape? So if nothing else, they could bring in tankered water if that's what they want to do. I'm sure this year we had a dry winter uh, dry for us, so they probably are importing water. Uh, but the, the what it did point out, actually, this whole exercise was we needed to collect off the house roof to ensure that we had an abundance. Um, and I don't believe they opted for that. Uh, it could be added, but um, yeah, so that's the way that went. Um, we had a couple other things in mind here, passive solar greenhouse and a little bit of a, a raised planter at the, at the entrance to the house. So this is our access layer, a little patio, uh, a permeable parking area. We're actually here, it's a gravel parking area with um, sort of an absorbent, um, well, we'll call it a swale. Uh, it's an infiltra infiltration swale, so water would come off the driveway, hit that, and then just disappear. Uh, well, not disappear, but it would uh, um, be infiltrated in the area around it. And they changed that a little bit. Uh, they wanted to go with, which I'll show you later, they wanted to go with some uh, permeable parking area which is way more money and uh, harder to do, but that's what uh, they wanted to do. And then, so this is the soil layer. So we've had water, access, and soil. So this is the soil being all the living components here, and those overlay into this initial concept, which is basically what uh, you will be producing in your final um in your final assignment. So at the end of that, you'll have this conceptual design. And then if you wanted uh, to go down the rabbit hole a bit further, uh, you would be getting into more detailed design. So this is where our, our design package stopped. And then they asked us uh, to quote some details. And now we know what they are, right? We know exactly where the plantings are and you know uh, quite a bit of detail about the uh, rainwater so that is essentially what we've done here and that kind of leads us up to uh, what we're asking for in the assignment so i won't uh, go through this at nauseum with you but basically what we're after is um with what you're doing uh, is, is similar to this in that we're just going to have you pick a, a small area. So instead of the whole plan, which you could do the whole, your whole landscape if you want, uh, but here we're just chunking out uh, a small area for this assignment. So you could essentially do something like this. So we have two trees. And we have a bunch of underplanting. Um, I've got the circle of death going on with my cursor, so I'm hoping that um, <clears throat> doesn't mean, oh, gone away. Good. Okay. Um, yeah. So here with the software we use, uh, which I won't get into, but it has these smart objects. So all these these symbols have data attached to them. So this particular symbol is an Acer Grissium and it's a paper bark maple and it's six centimeter caliper, which is the size um, measured, you know, probably at knee height 
and um, that symbol, wherever we place it on a drawing, will have at least this data and a lot more. And then it gets placed into a worksheet here where we have uh, our, our trees, shrubs, and perennials and grasses all separated, their common name, their quantity, their schedule size, so what pot size these are, and then just some comments about them. So when we go to price uh, an installation, we will send this list on its own off to a nursery for pricing. And I must say this drawing was put together uh, after reviewing some availability lists locally. <clears throat> so we wanna make sure we're, we're using things that are accessible. Now saying that between the time of the drawing and uh, pricing it, you know, there was changes in availability and, and we had to make uh, some adjustments. And one big one actually was this plant here, Osmanthus burkwoodi, which is a beautiful evergreen scented shrub. Um, they have really heavy deer pressure on this site. So we had our plants delivered and we were, we were going uh, about our, uh, <laughs> We were doing our planting. So the next day we come to work and they had been hammered by the deer. So we had to uh, take them all away and get uh, replacements. Uh, so we had to change that up. Um, but yeah, this, so basically with our labels, the, the number here is the quantity. And then we have the botanical name and size and the common name below. So all of these symbols that we have um, have that data attached to them. So these are just tags that we uh, hover over the, the symbol and it will display that data for us. So very, very helpful. Uh, but getting back to the reality of the assignment, um, you can see that we have <clears throat> trees here. And then these larger symbols are shrubs and same with some of them here. And then we have a lot of herbaceous in front of those layers. So let me see. Yeah, I did have, that's one thing our software can do is, uh, is give us a visualization of uh, what's trees and what's herbaceous and what's shrubs. And it didn't actually uh, look like it did it properly there. So that is a handy thing to do. Um, but we kind of do that when we put together our planting plans. So what we typically do is, and I'm sure it's obvious, is we start with the tree first. So we'll place our trees, and get that structural feel that we're after, right? And once we have all these trees in place, then we will go with that shrub layer. So we'll utilize um, shrubs that we have uh, agreed to use with our client. Uh, we put to together what's called a planting palette, which I'm not showing you here, but it's basically a, a list of all the potential plants that we could use in the design and our clients will uh, let us know if there's anything on there that they don't want us to use. Uh, and so when we have that palette uh, approved, then we're off to the races and uh, we will use, again, we place our, our trees, then we got our shrub elements in, and then we take a look and see if that is what we're trying to achieve in terms of structure. So, it's a little bit of a balance, as I'm sure you'll find, uh, when you have the tree and shrub structure, you know, how much of it you want in a given planting area, and, uh, and then that herbaceous element that's so dynamic in the summer, spring and summer, comes in um, as kind of the icing on the cake. So... 
here you can see there's quite a bit of that and there's actually a lot of ornamental grasses in here too uh, amongst other things there's some aconitum quite a bit um, which you know i wouldn't it's a beautiful plant but it is uh, poisonous so um, good thing to mention to your clients about uh, some lots of sword ferns under the under planting and some maiden grass and um, some uh, papaver, all kinds of stuff. Cardoon, which is a edible. Um, a flomus, which I love using. A lot of stuff here that sort of crosses between medicinal and um, and ornamental. Um, but this is basically what we end up producing right got all these symbols we have labels and because we have these labels uh, and unique symbols we only have to put one label on it so boom we've got 27 uh, polystichum munitum in here but we just have to label one right so it really is you could do this with a legend and some people do and probably something that you'd want to do, I don't know, but <clears throat> again, it, it's a um, little bit of apples and oranges because we can edit all of our symbols and make whatever we want, basically. Um, then on this side towards the house, of course, we only had one tree and a kind of a shrubby um, framework and then some bomb proof herbaceous items in here so that's kind of how we approach it and <clears throat> here's a couple more beds um it's a good example here with this bed we have a whole bunch of existing plant material that we documented that are you might have a hard time seeing them but they're grayed here and so what we were doing was augmenting uh, our work with that. And I can actually show you. That exact. go I will just stop share and this was just from a post uh, we did a few weeks back but that's basically that area uh, they had a bunch of um, rhododendrons that uh, were planted by some very well-known horticultural hmm. Uh, well, people that, that had a lot to do with the introduction of rhododendrons in British Columbia. Uh, so it was a well-known garden. But anyways, <laughs> these are suffering. But actually, we added some of these. And then what we do when we have finished our woody planting, which is what happened here, there's tree and shrub elements added to these existing plants that you can see were hammered back pretty hard in the heat dome the year previous. Uh, we come in and we do our, we irrigate uh, the woody plants. And this is my wife here and uh, one of the people that helps us out uh, now and then. Um, and here we're, we're using a, an, a, a raised micro spray uh, effect um, and then after this is done, we come in and we do the herbaceous or the underplanting and then mulch. So it's kind of a multi-stepped approach here. And I know it's probably an awful lot to take in, but um, I think it's healthy to, for most of you to see 
how one can take, uh, you know, some of these ideas that are on paper and start to execute them. Cause that is a whole, <laughs> that could be a whole course on its own, uh, is how to make it happen and, uh, and, you know, um, make it viable for you as an installer and give your clients lots of value. So, uh, yes, in this case, we had these existing plants and we added to them. Um, and that's what we've shown here. So lots of ferns, um, nothing too dramatic otherwise, but again, uh, that those are labeled. And that's uh, a good thing to do. And let's see what else we got here. <clears throat> Some details on the hardscape. So this was this permeable paving that uh, our clients wanted. So we've got some info on that. And also with their little flagstone patio, they wanted, you know, it to infiltrate water and have a little bit of a softening edge here, which is very difficult to achieve. So much easier just to compact and, and turn an area into a hardscape uh, versus trying to, to, to blend both together here. That, that can be quite tricky. So yeah, that was uh, one example that we've got here. Um, how is everybody doing? Does anybody have any questions they want to throw out at all about uh, any part of what we've talked about today or, or anything else would be fine too? No. Okay. Well, what I can do, I can, uh, show you another example here. And the installs are always lots of fun. It's something that um, we're backing away from, though. This year we haven't done any. And um, I don't know if we'll be doing them anymore. We'll see. Okay. Uh, so, again, this is a part of a package we did for a client. Um, there's Sector Compass, which I don't have to uh, introduce you to. Uh, not sure why part of my title block didn't show up, but uh, you'll notice that with, with all of the drawings that will have a little corner of the sheet that's dedicated to our title block, you know, our information. Uh, we have a revision notes here. Uh, so we know we're dealing with the relevant um, drawing and then the name and the scale and blah, 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 blah. But um, this is a water layer we did for this particular client. And <clears throat> this is their micro water shed which is huge. And we calculated, let me see here, what? Yeah, it's like three and a half million liters annually that hits the site, which in US gallons, so that's probably 800,000 gallons. And for a little urban property, that's quite a bit. Um, and you can see with this base plan, they had an existing, <clears throat> they had an existing, um, uh, retaining system here. I'll bring up some pictures for that. I got a few minutes. Um, <clears throat> and this was all rotting out. So this is critical information. We know if we're redoing any retaining here that the high ground up behind us here, even though it's all wooded, you're still going to feel it uh, in the winter time. And um, that uh, that did come um, 
into reality when we were doing the job. I'll have to show you what happened because it's good to good to see what happens when things go wrong, uh, which they did, but it's all good. We fixed it. Sorry, I'm just trying to find my images here. There we go. So let me see. So this is what the existing, that back landscape looks like. All railway ties that were painted. <laughs> and uh, there's virtually nothing here landscape-wise. There's a nice uh, hazelnut. Um, but it was all full of carpenter ants and, and pretty ugly. But... You know, we never get called to beautiful <laughs> projects. They're only beautiful after, hopefully. So we'll go back to that drawing here. We've got a few more minutes. All right, so we calculated, you know, catchment off these two roof areas. And uh, we had planned on a rain garden in the front. And the rain garden, let's see. Uh, we're also going to send water off this new patio <clears throat> to the rain garden. Um, and this is our soil layer. And we're just showing planted areas versus lawn areas versus uh, hardscape. And this is, so this is kind of an initial concept. Right, so there's nothing specific here other than with the symbols, you can kind of tell this is a shrub, that's a tree, you know, that's about it, right? There's nothing really written in stone. This is uh, quite a, a slope here at the front of the house, and we're just going to retain the bottom in this concept with logs. And then it's just all clearly labeled. So, you know, ultimately, when you get to the end of the course, this is the kind of, uh, not exactly like this, but this information is the type of info you're going to want to show. Just some very basic. So then we go to the uh, planting plan, which you can see is, um, <clears throat> is fairly uh, detailed. So this is a good example of what we like to do. Here we can show where our tree and shrub elements are in relationship to all the other plantings. And then we can show, oh, sorry about that. Uh, then we can show the herbaceous plants. And that's really helpful when we're designing just to make sure we're not, because uh, we knew in the front, this front slope, we don't want anything woody there. We don't want anything blocking views. Uh, we want it to be pretty dynamic. So that is a, a full planting plan of the, of the front and the back garden. And then these two sheets, this is the rear garden here, and this sheet is for the front. So we did the rear garden um, over two phases. We first built the we first built the walls and patio and then did the landscape. Uh, and then we started on the front and we didn't do this little strip here. So I'm not sure if we are going to be doing that or not. Um, time will tell. Let me just uh, run you through. Oops. So I want to show you what happened in the winter. It always seems to happen on our holidays. So when we were taking a Christmas break for two weeks, uh, we got a call. Uh, I don't know if I have those pictures here. Bummer. Anyways, 
<laughs> we got a call. Their clients were concerned about water. There's all this water here. And we're like, what? Um, and we showed up and the whole patio was just flooded. And um, <clears throat> we've worked with this mason for oh, almost 20 years, right? Never had any issues at all. So we called him and, you know, what's going on? Um, he showed up and, uh, and fixed it. But what had happened here was at the back of the wall, let's just see. So the back, this back area here, um, he, you obviously have to put drainage in there and he had one of his guys throw some drainage in behind. And the fellow went way too fast and ended up um, making a mistake. <clears throat> so the, the drainage at the back of the wall here was not functioning at all. So all that water, that, uh, you know, 800,000 gallons of uh, runoff, uh, which would come primarily through November to January, was hitting the, the back of this wall and had nowhere to go. So, you know, that's one good thing about um, Allen Block is it has some permeability to it. And it was just oozing at the bottom and out the side. And um, uh, it, it got all rectified. I'm surprised I do not have my pictures of it. Um, it was a little bit horrifying to see at uh, Christmas, but um, uh, yeah, anyways, it got fixed up. He had to, uh, it was a painful repair because he had to pull down uh, this whole section of wall and redo it. So, but it, it all uh, turned out well and, but you can't ignore water. Sorry, I'm, Wizen through this. I'm trying to uh, to get some after images here for you. So they turned out really well. This um, little enclosed veggie garden we did as well for these people. And this is just, you know, basically the first summer. So things did really well. They love it. And uh, it looks great this year. And basically with this, you know, a big part of this was A, uh, we made a change to the design where you might have noticed in the previous pictures, uh, this was an at-grade bed, but because of the water issues, we put in um, basically some uh, landscape fabric at the bottom with a bunch of uh, drain rock and a perforated pipe leading out the base. So the whole bottom of this below paver level is drained off uh, during the winter months. And then this little bit of elevation here is good to go. We're not going to be swimming in water. So that was a little bit of a change that we did to have these two raised beds. Uh, well, three actually. Here's another one here. Uh, right here. And uh, it looks better. So it's one of those things, you know, you hit hit a tough part and you have to make a change, but it was, in my opinion, uh, an improvement. So, and then we did the front here and we're not going to really dive into that today. Maybe that's for next uh, go around. Uh, and we can talk about all the preparation that we do uh, when we go and tear into a landscape. We were going to use logs here and we, uh, decided to use rock instead, but, um, yeah, that gives you a little bit of, uh, a peek at, um, a couple of our projects. Anyhow, um, does anybody have anything that they want to ask about before we call it a day? No. All right. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for joining me today. And I look forward to seeing your assignments next week. And if you uh, run into any challenges between now and then, uh, please don't hesitate to drop me a note, and I'm happy to help you out. So 
Thank you again, and everybody have a great week. <laughs> we'll see you later.